Yeah, everybody's everybody's terrified. There we go. Twenty one twenty five. All right. Thank you, Beyond Repute, for the five. Let's go with an e four. Okay, we have a French. And let's see. All right. So um, I propose that we play the same line uh, that I played a couple of games ago, which is originally named after Nimzovich, but Peter brought it to my attention, so I call it the Giannato's French. And it starts off as an advance, which is e5. Does anybody remember what characterizes... Okay, never mind. b6. That is a comparatively rare sideline. Obviously, almost everybody plays c5 in that position. And in that position, knight f3 was the move I intended to play. Now here, um, there is no reason to dilly-dally around. We can just develop our pieces. The idea of b6, I'm familiar with this line. Uh, the idea is to go bishop a6 and trade off the bad French bishop. And we have a very clever way to play this, I think. Uh, and that is to start with the move c3. Who can tell me why this is clever? Can black go bishop a6 there? Can black... Bishop, queen d7 is actually correct. But why is bishop a6 bad? Because if bishop takes a6, knight takes a6, and queen a4 picks off the knight. So queen d7 is actually correct. And this covers this diagonal in preparation for bishop a6. Okay, so... What I propose to do is first to develop the bishop to d3. And here, I think most people would be inclined to go knight f3. But I quite like the idea of putting the knight on e2. What is the advantage of that? The advantage of that is that it leaves the f-pawn unobstructed, which means that once we castle, we have this very typical plan of advancing the f-pawn forward as quickly as possible to break down the king side. So in these types of French positions, I, I like putting the knight on e2. Yeah, he managed to trade the light squared bishops, but that's cost him a couple of tempi. Okay, first we want to develop, obviously. We don't want to do anything rash. And h5. Okay, so he is probably preparing knight f5. Interesting, interesting way to play. Um, playing f4 here wouldn't be very sensible at this point, because he would just park the knight on f5, and then we wouldn't be able to make progress. So I propose... We simply develop our pieces. I don't think we should do anything extraordinary here. What does that mean, develop our pieces? How? No, we don't want to play h4. Uh, we want to let him play h4 and then play h3 to freeze the pawn that way. Yeah, I think bishop g5 makes sense. Sticking the bishop onto a weak square. And then getting this knight out to d2 and potentially later to f3. Let's go. Let's uh, speed up a little bit here. Knight d2. I think, I think he's managed to equalize here, but... It, you know, the better player will win. C5. All right. So, very chaotic and very complex French position. Um, I think we have many, we have several ways to play this. What annoys me here about Black's position is this knight. I think this knight uh, is a very troublesome piece because it's exerting pressure on d4 and it's clogging up the king side. So, based on what I told you guys just a couple of moments ago, I think knight g3 makes the most sense, trying to trade off the knight. Yeah, very good. If he takes on g3, I think we have a very interesting way to recapture, because the rules would tell us to capture toward the center, but if you know where we are attacking, then I think the correct move should be obvious. A uh, g6. Wow. Really weakening the dark squares. Bishop f6 is asking to be played, but maybe we should hold off on that move. Maybe we should hold off on that move. Hmm. Let me think for a second. We have some very interesting stuff that we could do here. We could take on f5. We could take on f5 at our leisure, but there's no hurry to do that. There's no, there's no need to do that immediately. I think we can improve our position first. You know what? Let's stick the bishop on f6 first, and then we'll think. Okay, now what I propose is that we bring this knight into the game with knight f3. And I potentially see an interesting path via g5 to h7 and later to f6. That would be the goal. That would be the American dream, so to speak. Bishop e7. Now, do we need to respond to this? Do we need to move the bishop away or do we let him take it? Yeah, we're going to centralize the rooks, but first I want people to answer that question. No, we don't. Because if he takes, we take with a pawn and we have this beautiful e5 square for our knight. So what I propose we do is actually a move that you guys will roll your eyes at, but I think is probably good. 
Let's go a3. Those of you who play the advanced French will understand the idea of this move. I want to get this pawn out of my hair. How do we do that? What am I preparing? I want to get this pawn out of my hair. b4. Get out of here. Pawn on c5. Obviously, we want him to take on d4 because then the c-file will open. And given how weak his king is, the more files get open, the better. If he goes c4, it's kind of a win-win for us. Then the pawn on d4 will no longer be under pressure. Our hands are untied, and we can start playing on the king's side. If you play the advanced French, you should be familiar with this idea. a3, b4, trying to get this pawn to decide what it's going to do. So we're building up the tension. Something is going to happen right now. I feel like a lot is going on. Knight, knights are in contact. Bishops are in contact. Pawns are in contact. And he decides to take on d4 which I kind of like to see, because now we're going to put a rook on c1, and we potentially have the plan of doubling. He can't really castle long. That's suicidal. And he can't castle short anymore because he's already moved his rook, yeah? Hopefully this is making sense so far. Our next move is very likely to be rook ac1. Okay. What is the idea of this move? What is the idea of this move? And at this point, he wants to play knight g4 in order to dislodge our bishop. So the prophylactic approach here would be to go h3 and circumscribe this knight completely. We're trying to play prophylactically here and patiently. Once we limit the knight, then we're going to go rook c1. This move is not going anywhere. Rook c1. And we have a very clear plan of doubling on the c-file. Nothing extraordinary there. Queen a6 is also something to consider in certain positions but okay knight b8 whoa no this has to be winning for us at this point okay i have an interesting proposal now what is the high level goal here high level goal is to take control of the of the c file in order to do that we want to take the rook and what move allows us to prepare rook c1 with tempo so how do we prepare rook c1 with tempo yeah, queen e3 or queen d2. I don't know if it matters which of these moves we make. Queen d2 may be marginally more precise because if he goes knight f5, that does not occur with tempo and we can play rook c1 anyway. Although we would probably end up taking the knight anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Rook c1. We have the c-file now. We've won the queen side battle. Let's see if we can win the king side battle. Now, obviously, we need to get this knight out of the picture. Get out of here. Now, what does it mean to win the kingside battle? What should our next move be? In fact, both after GF and after actually after EF, I think we have a much stronger move. But in case he plays GF, think about how we are going to seize control of the kingside. Not knight g5, although that's a decent move. I think there's a far more direct approach. I think there's a far more direct approach. No need to take on e7. There's no reason for us to trade. Do not trade in these kinds of positions unless there's a compelling reason to do so. Let's get in there with the queen, queen h6. I feel like this is crushing. Do you see how we've gotten control of the key artery in the position, the c-file? And once we've done that, we've ensured that black is essentially tied down. The queen cannot move because we will infiltrate. And this is a classic example of playing on both sides of the board. We played on the queen side. We did sufficient damage and now we are transitioning to the king side where black is at his most vulnerable we have many ideas in this position first of all simply taking on h5 okay what should we take with what should we take with yeah okay, let's get this beautiful juicy square on e5 and we have some very pretty ideas hanging in the air Some very special ideas here. Okay. Yeah, of course you would. Queen d8. How do we continue accumulating the pressure? I know many of you are seeing queen g7. I think his move was aimed against that move because if we go queen g7, he takes it and then goes king up to e7, stopping the pawn. So we have to be... Very disciplined here in these positions. We're not playing for the brilliancy prize. We're playing... We play to win the game. Let me think. 
This is not as easy as it appears. Because he wants knight d7 here. I actually I actually want to take some time here. Hmm. All right. Let's go knight e5. This is not easy because he goes knight d7. This is a lot harder than it looks. Once he goes knight d7, that pawn on f6 is liable to fall, and we have to be very disciplined. All right, so here I think I see a key move. Yeah, so it's a simple move, just taking on h5. But actually, this was hard to see. I think taking on h5 is the simplest because he cannot take with a queen on f6 due to rook c8. He cannot take with a knight on f6 due to checkmate. And if he takes on e5, then we cement the pawn on f6, and the rest should be quite easy there. Maybe it's not the best, but um, I think this is good enough to win. You can free move d takes e5. Rook f8. All right. All right. God, there's got to be a win here, but I'm kind of struggling here. Uh-huh. I see it. I think I see it. Does anybody see the winning move? No, not knight c6, guys. You're sloppy. Knight c6, queen takes f6. The move is rook c6, I'm pretty sure. Why? Because of this pin, we're threatening rook takes e6 with a devastating, completely devastating attack. This is essentially a checkmate threat. In fact, this move follows even against knight takes knight. We intermezzo rook takes e6, and then we take the knight, and black's position is destroyed. And if he plays queen takes f6, that's actually what took me a while, is figuring out what to do after queen takes f6. And the win there is very prosaic, but it's easy in retrospect, but it's not so easy when you're actually calculating. Who sees it? Chess Brainiac, what's up? Rook c8 check, king e7, and then what? All of you guys are giving the easy move, but what's the follow-up after king e7? It's simple. Okay, check. You're falling for the tempting move. You're giving a check on c6. Why are you giving this check? Do you see a follow-up to king d6, or are you, are you playing this just because it's a check? See, this is where you have to refrain from the tempting moves and start by looking at the captures. Rook c7 is also not gg because of rook d8. The move is to simply take the knight. See, in fact, I think these are the hardest moves to find. It's the simple captures that fall out of your field of vision because your brain is in tactics mode. You're looking at sacrifices and these easy moves. And when I say easy, I don't literally mean easy. I mean moves that moves that look deceptively simple. Well, they're the ones that are hard to find. Okay, so rook takes c8 and now we take the queen or upper queen. This is actually a very nice game. What's the fastest method of winning here? Identify the pass spawn, push it h4, h5, etc. We don't even need to think. Just h5. Maybe we should have given a check on g5 first, but it doesn't matter. We don't care about this pawn. Our pawn is much faster. Check and h6 on the next move. Don't pre-move anything here. If you pre-move h6, you might get an f6. This was a very nice game, yeah. So just h6. Remember, we have some luft, so... Resigns. That's a great game. Um, so let's go over quickly, and then we have box box. So b6 is a viable sideline. This is one of the main sidelines in the French. Um, after c5, I was going to play the, the Giannato's French with knight f3. c takes d4 and bishop d3. And I have a speedrun game here a couple of games ago. You guys can review this. It'll eventually be up on YouTube. But b6, I don't know whether I play the theoretical move, but I feel like c3 is quite clever. Bishop a6 loses a piece to take stakes queen a4. And so queen d7 is a very common move. Bishop d3, bishop a6, and knight e2. Idea being 
we are eventually preparing f4, and this knight is often going to go over to g3. Okay, takes, takes, knight e7, castles, and h5. So the move h5 creates a weak square on g5, which we occupy with our bishop. Uh, a lot of you guys have the instinct of going h4, but that's not a necessary move. Let me let us imagine for a second that black drives the pawn to h4. The fact is this pawn is more of a weakness than a strength, because if we ultimately get our knight to f3, we can begin a direct assault on this pawn. It, it, we're not going to get checkmated here. So it's often better to wait for your opponent to come to h4 and then fix the pawn like this, rather than create weaknesses of your own with h4. Okay? So we go bishop g5, occupying weak square, knight f5, knight d2, and c5. So here, it's a simple matter of identifying really the only piece that's developed and trying to trade it off. This is a good, I think, piece of advice in general. When your opponent lags behind a development, trading off his only developed piece often serves to essentially cause the position to collapse, which is why we go knight g3. So after knight takes g3, which he didn't play, who can explain to me what we would have captured with and why? This actually leads me to a small detour and a very important point. Lord Clickbay, thank you for the prime. Yeah, so you guys are all answering correctly. Um, you want to capture away from the center. You want to capture away from the center. And um, I'm trying to find a famous game that Magnus Carlsen played where he actually did something very, very similar. And it was pretty shocking when he did this. I think this was either against Aronian or this was against Mamidyarov. It was one of the two. Yeah, it was against the Iranian. So this is the concept of capturing away from the center in order to open a file. Remember that. Keep this in the back of your mind. Do not automatically capture toward the center. Here, f takes g3 is a no-brainer, followed by doubling on the f file and an immediate assault on the f7 pawn. Um, in uh, Magnus's Carlsen game, I mean, I don't know why I remember that game specifically. There are many, many examples of this. But I remember when this game was played, it was like big, big deal. It was like a super, super big thing. And so I guess that's why I remembered it. Yeah, so this was Carlson Aronian 2014. I was watching this game live. And in this very topical Rogozin line, Magnus plays F takes G3, which uh, was an insane novelty. Nobody had thought to play this move. And the reason for that is because it weakens the e3 pawn. It seems unthinkable to create such a weakness. But Magnus determined that the open f file was so important that it was actually worth weakening the e3 pawn over. And he won the game. Aronian was 28-15 when this game was played. And he didn't necessarily win because of this novelty. The position was very unclear. And the role that the f file actually played in his win is limited. But the fact remains. Moves like f takes g3 always need to be considered. Capturing away from the center in order to open files, something to file away in your positional directory. Okay, so g6 by our opponent, we grab the weak square created by that last move. Rook g8, knight f3, and here black's position starts to deteriorate. I don't think he should have played bishop b7. I think he should have developed to c6 straight away. Um, but it's, it's hard to give good advice in such a position. Bishop b7, and here... I went a3, which I actually am really happy about. Trying to go b4. I think black should have gone a5. I think by allowing b4, the pressure on black's position became essentially unbearable. Um, now, what would be a good idea here is actually to play a4 and secure this gaping hole on b5, which we can later occupy with the queen. In such positions, you don't need to be in a hurry. White just accumulates the advantages, and black's position is under a tremendous amount of pressure. Um... You might ask also, why am I not taking on f5? Is Didn't I just say that we want to eliminate black's strongest piece? Well, the reason we aren't hurrying is that there's nothing... This is not going to backfire on us. We can take on f5 whenever we want, whereas black taking on g3 would only favor us. So there's often stuff on the chessboard where you can do it now, you can do it later. you got to always ask yourself, am I in a hurry? Is there a serious risk that my opponent is going to retract the offer? 
He tried doing this in the game, but knight h6 was not a serious move. That knight wasn't going anywhere. And by keeping the tension, you're able to accumulate more pressure. And oftentimes, you're able to keep your options open, which is what we did here. We took on f5 when the moment was right. b4. And here, I think definitely black should have kept the center closed, although we would have redirected the queen to the king side. After cd, cd, the position plays itself. h3, stopping knight g4. Why was knight g4 a dangerous idea? Because we do not want this bishop kicked out of f6. We want it sitting there like a splinter, like a bone in black's throat. h3 is classic prophylaxis. Now rook c1, and black got impatient, knight b8. I don't think that this really changed the course of the game. The same thing would have happened if we had doubled on the c file and created, un you know, unstoppable pressure against the rook. Boom, boom, boom. Now, simple logic. We want to go rook c1. We can't go rook c1 because it's undefended. So we use the undefended knight on h6 in order to kill two birds with one stone. We force it back to f5, and we prepare rook c1. Boom. And now that we have got, grabbed control of the c file, we transition to the other side of the board. Now, a very instructive opportunity would have occurred after e takes f5. Of course, we can play queen h6 here or knight g5, and it's winning. But... I think white has a very flashy move that wins even faster. Who can tell me what it is? Yeah. So this is a very classic idea, right? You essentially force the pawn out of a square and then you push it. And the reason you push it is to carve out the square where the pawn previously was. Right? This is a very classic positional idea with which all of you guys should be very familiar. I've shown many, many times um, one of my favorite games on the subject, uh, which is um, not a famous game, but a very instructive one. And I've, I've shown it on this stream, so don't be surprised if you have seen this before. Okay. And my lesson with Boxbox Box will begin very shortly, so. Okay, so this is... Um, Jonathan Rosen, who was the first Scottish Grandmaster, author of several very well-received books on chess psychology, which I highly recommend. And he reached this position against an IM from England. In this position, he does something very instructive. I think most of us would want to play bishop h4, because why the hell would you give away this bishop? And yet Rosen takes on f6, and now he plays e5. D takes e5, knight g e4, occupying the square left behind by the pawn. And the tactical justification is that he takes f4, which would be ideal for black, does not work because of knight takes f6 and the rook on e8 hangs. Again, undefended pieces are very important. And now white entombs the bishop with f5. Look at the domination imposed on black's position by this knight. And now white has the very simple idea of doubling on the f file and crashing through on the king side. The knight is completely dominating here. Simple, but very nice. And it's the same general concept, clearing out a square so that your knight can occupy it. After f takes c6, knight e5, black's position totally collapses. For instance, queen d8, bishop b7, queen e7, rook comes in with checkmate. If queen b7, we take on e7, and this is completely, utterly lost for black. Okay, um, just wanted to show this as an example of carving out a square. Here we infiltrate to h6, and the game is over. Takes, takes, queen d8. Um, and it's entirely possible I didn't play the ideal moves. No, this is the top engine move. Queen takes h5. Very materialistic, but very effective. If queen takes f6, the rook comes into c8. Um, so rook f8, and now rook c6 is actually very important. What's wrong with queen h7? Well, queen h7 doesn't do that much because of rook f8. And the rook simultaneously evades capture and defends f7. So I think this is a hot spot for blunders for a lot of people, is these positions where it seems like anything wins. And I think the first step toward avoiding blundering in these positions is to change your mentality. You should never start by assuming that a bunch of moves win. Your assumption should always, in my opinion, be that there's only one winning continuation, even if there isn't. But that really helps you create a strict basis on which you evaluate ideas. Because what happens is that you... You get lazy, right? You think, ah, this wins, this wins, that wins. Let me just play some move. And all of a sudden, the advantage evaporates. Thank you, Marshall, for the five gifted and Sambo for the subs. Queen takes h5. This is a great example of that. So a lot of you were suggesting knight c6. 
one move threat itis. The only reason you're tempted by this move is because it threatens the queen, but it's actually a very bad move. It clogs the C file. After queen takes f6, black is right back into the game. How did I find rook c6? Well, I noticed that the biggest advantage of white's position is this pin. So this pawn on e6 is actually a huge weakness. And using the c-file, we're able to create an unstoppable threat here. If knight, knight takes e5, then rook takes e6. King d7. And the most accurate is to give another check on e7. And to play d takes e5 with queen takes f5 to follow white's white discretion. Um, after queen takes f6 comes the second moment when I think a lot of you fell fell prey to this idea. Very tempting, but easy to establish that knight c6 is wrong due to king d6, and the king escapes. Kings are a very slippery piece. Unfortunately, this rook on f8 is, un is defended by the knight. Maybe some of you missed that. So these are the moments where you have to be the most careful. Even the move rook c7 is not quite as convincing due to rook d8. And again, knight c6 check. There's king d6, and the position is not so clear. Now, white can play rook takes a7, and yes, white is completely winning here. But I would argue that the way that I played is more forcing and more immediately winning. And how do you find moves like knight takes d7? How do you ensure that there are no blind spots? Well, checks captures threats. And if you want to apply that advice properly, remember that no capture should be excluded from that. You shouldn't only look at fancy captures. You should look at regular captures as well. They can be the most effective moves. Um, and remember that just because you solve a bunch of tactics doesn't mean that in every position the solution will be something fancy. Sometimes the simplest possible approach is the most effective. Can you play rook takes b8 first? No, because if you take here first, I will take with the knight. I will not take with the king and allow you to fork me. Right? So this idea of the knight recapturing is quite annoying. We have to play knight takes d7, and it's very important that the queen is under attack here. And it's also very important, and I want to make one final point here before we go with uh, box box. Um, remember why I played h3. Thank you for gifting to Chess Brainiac. Why did I play h3 initially? It was a prophylactic move aimed against knight g4. But when you play prophylactically, what happens is that your moves have positive byproducts, which you have no idea about until you realize that they do. So it turns out that this entire combination would not have worked without the move h3 because black would have had a back rank mate. So when you play in a cautious and sort of deep manner, I often find that you kind of get rewarded for that. You, you know, the 50-50 balls go your way and you find that you kind of get lucky uh, in the right moment. So I kind of rushed this because we have a short lesson with box box here, but um, I hope that you guys enjoyed the analysis. This was a really nice game.